Good morning and welcome from the Marin Institute of Urban Management at New York University. I'm Angela Hawken, the Director of the Institute. Uh, our webinar today is co-hosted with the journal Buildings and Cities. Uh, soon I'll introduce our co-host Richard Lorch. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Marin Institute, we are a think-do tank focused on critical issues facing cities and our mandate is impact. We invest in academics and practice scholars who are interested in on-the-ground research, working alongside practitioners and the public they serve to test new ideas and approaches that are scalable and have the potential to dramatically improve the quality of life for people in cities across the globe. This is the third webinar in the Urban Expansion Series. There are four webinars in this series. If you've missed any of the earlier ones, you'll find those recordings online as well as other recordings hosted by Dr. Angel and our team in the Urban Expansion Program. As we review these webinars, we are humbled by the attendance at these sessions. We have panelists and attendees who are zooming in from cities across the globe and represent top-notch universities, think tanks, agencies, and practice organizations. So thank you for joining these important conversations. It shows us that there's a strong interest among academics and practitioners alike in ensuring that our cities are built in ways that allow all of their residents to thrive. Uh, today's session is devoted to better understanding the successes, the failures, and the consequences of efforts to contain urban expansion, and there's a focus on three case studies. But before we kick off, I have a few notes on logistics. Uh, there's a chat function and a Q&A function. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Um, we'll get to as many of these as we can during the session, but any questions that aren't asked, answered will be addressed by the panelists and, re and returned to everybody who registered for today. If you have a general comment, please feel free to use the chat function. Uh, in that chat function, I'll also be posting a link to our Marin newsletter. Please subscribe to that if you want to stay in touch and to be updated on the work of the Urban Expansion team and also to receive notices of future webinar sessions. We also want to let our attendees know that the session today is being recorded. So on behalf of NYU Marin, it's now my great pleasure to introduce our co-host for today, Richard Lorch. Richard is an architect, a researcher, a writer, and the editor-in-chief of Buildings and Cities. Richard, we're grateful for your continued engagement with us at New York University and that you're co-hosting with us again today. I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Let me just get the screens going. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. And let me add my warm welcome to this webinar um, to all of you today. Um, as Angela said, this peer reviewed journal, Buildings and Cities, occupies a unique space in academic publishing. It provides a transdisciplinary approach to the built environment and it focuses on the interplay between the different scales of the built environment particularly between buildings and cities, but also neighborhoods, national building stocks and infrastructures. The decisions about the growth of cities have long-term impacts. They define land use, patterns of infrastructure and have enormous implications for human development and resource consumption. This webinar series explores quantitative and qualitative dimensions of urban expansion when, where, and how expansion can and should be contained, and when, where, and how it can and should be managed in an orderly, inclusive, and sustainable manner. The series of webinars is a prelude to a special issue in buildings and cities on this topic. Currently, there's a call for papers on this topic, and Solly Angel is the guest editor. If you are investigating the phenomena of urban expansion, we invite you to submit an abstract to the special issue, details of which are on the screen here. Please don't hesitate to contact Professor Angel or me. The deadline is 3rd of December. Further details about the scope of the special issue and how to submit can be found online. We know that sprawl is detrimental to the surrounding countryside, costly in terms of infrastructure, wasteful in energy and resources, and increases greenhouse gas emissions. This raises a series of questions about whether and how the spatial containment of cities can be addressed. How effective have previous efforts been and what lessons can we take forward into the future? 
I welcome all of you today to today's discussions on the forces that drive and shape urban expansion. The multifaceted perspectives from our speakers will enhance our understandings of how cities change and what options exist to harness and alter these complex and varied forces. It's now my pleasure to hand over to uh, Bill Fischel. Professor William A. Fischel is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Economics at Dartmouth College. He's the author of Zoning Rules, The Economics of Land Use Regulation and Regulatory Takings, um, sorry, of Land Use Regulation, and the second book, Regulatory Takings, Law, Economics, and Politics. Over to you, Bill. Bill, you're on mute. Yeah, I was I was muted because they're uh, blowing leaves, so you'll have to endure the background noise uh, from the Dartmouth College uh, uh, grounds crew. Um, it is my duty and pleasure to introduce the uh, the panelists uh, for today's uh, seminar. Uh, uh, the first speaker, I think, following is going to be uh, Sally Angel, who, whom you know is at the uh, uh, Marone Institute uh, at NYU. Um, he is a leader, in my opinion, uh, I think in many people's opinion, in the uh, uh, global comparisons of urban growth, something not, not uh, systematically accomplished before Sally got into this with his uh, various co-authors. And uh, he has... Uh, uh, I, I've used his work in my course when I was teaching urban economics as, as one of the premier uh, uh, devices there. Uh, he has assembled, uh, along with others, uh, 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 three scholars from three different continents. Uh, 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 the first one is Adele Horn, who is a lecturer in urban and regional planning in the Department of Geography and Earth. Environmental Studies at Stellenbosch University in the Western Cape in South Africa. Um, she's the author of several review papers. I won't list them all. I'll let them talk about their papers. The second speaker is Myung Jin Jun uh, uh, of South Korea, is professor of urban planning and real estate in the Department of Urban Planning and Real Estate at Chung An University in Seoul, South Korea. And again, author of several papers reviewed uh, vetted. Uh, on, on uh, containment of urban expansion. And our third is Alan Mace, Associate Professor of Urban Planning Studies at the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science uh, in, in London, England, of course. And he is an expert on the green belt, something that has always fascinated me. So uh, with that uh, introduction, I think my job for now is right uh, is done. And, uh, who do I hand it off to now? Sally? Thank you, Bill. Uh, I will share my screen. Uh, my first slide is a picture of the urban growth boundary in Portland, Oregon, an example of the successful containment of urban expansion. The containment of urban expansion by green belts, urban growth boundaries, and other restrictions on the conversion of land from rural to urban use is now the prevailing planning paradigm in most cities, in both less developed and more developed countries. In a survey of a global sample of 200 cities we conducted for UN Habitat in 2016, we posed the question, is containing the expansion of the city an explicit goal of the zoning and land use plan? Informants in two thirds of the cities answered yes. 71% of informants in cities in less developed countries and 53% of informants in cities in more developed ones. Unfortunately, our survey did not obtain information on two important questions. One, whether containment was fully effective, only partially effective, or not effective at all. And two, what was the justification, if any, given for pursuing containment? I will come back to the justification question. The answer to the first question must for now remain anecdotal. 
my own observations regarding the, preval the prevalence of effective containment in the cities in the world at large are at this stage educated guesses. The three panelists following me will acquaint you with three important case studies that shed light on the issue of effective containment. I shall provide a couple more examples myself. I would venture to say that broadly speaking, containment is successfully enforced when a well-managed public authority with jurisdiction over the entire extent of the city and beyond manages to withstand the pressure to expand over a long period of time. The pressure to expand is largely fueled by the demand for more room. In other words, more floor space for both residences and workplaces, a demand which is fluid, uh, fueled by both population growth and income growth, or by one of them in the absence of the other. When the supply of floor space within the existing footprints of cities is not able to respond to this demand, either because of regulations, NIMBYism, or simply because of lack of construction finance, then the pressure to expand in the face of unaffordable floor space is typically irresistible. Except for a few known outliers, my own observations of the global sample of cities suggest that cities with effective containment, namely containment that can accommodate urban population and income growth within, within a prescribed perimeter appear to be few and far between. Frankfurt, for example, has a green belt that encircles the city core, which has 750,000 people, but it is the core of a functional metropolitan area, including outlying cities with strong commuting relationships to Frankfurt that is more than three times larger. I would venture to speculate, and I would love to be proved wrong, that among the 4,000 plus cities and metropolitan areas, that had 100,000 of people or more in 2010, not more than 1% could boast of effective long-term containment of their aerial extent. I believe that containment is indeed on the books in many cities, that is an official master plans uh, that have no statutory authority and are not enforced. And in many others with good intentions coupled with weak efforts at enforcement have until now simply failed. Let me give two examples of failed containment. An historical one, the failure of the Tokyo Green Belt of 1941 to contain its rapid post-war expansion, and a more recent one, the failure of the Chinese government to control recent urban expansion. This map shows the abandoned 1941 Green Belt in Tokyo superimposed on its built up extent in 2014. The area within this abandoned green belt is 450 square kilometers. The area of Tokyo in 2014 was 14 times larger, 6,400 plus square kilometers. The lands for the Tokyo green belt were acquired by the municipality and taken over by the air defense and civil defense forces during the second world war. After the war, they were sold off by the occupation government to farmers and then eventually urbanized. In China, to take a different example, metropolitan governments typically have planning jurisdictions over the entire expansion area, areas and beyond. They regularly prepare metropolitan expansion plans that seek to limit their expansion. The central government in China has issued numerous decrees lim limiting metropolitan expansion plans, typically in the name of preserving agricultural land to protect this country's food security. It reserves the power to review and approve such plans to ensure compliance. On paper, Chinese provinces are mandated to keep fixed the amount of cultivated land in the province. Any reduction due to urban expansion must be compensated by an equivalent increase in cultivated land somewhere else in the province. Still, urban expansion in China proceeds at a much faster pace than that prescribed in official plans. The 2000 10 plan for the city of Zhengzhou, for example, submitted in 1998, estimated its 2010 population 2.3 million and its area at 189 square kilometers. Both were surpassed by 2003. The slide you see is of the Tokyo, of the Beijing Greenbelt. The, the fate of the Greenbelt of Beijing is illustrative 
of this failure to limit urban expansion in China as well. The red area in this map is the area within the 2003 uh, Beijing Green Belt, officially designated Green Belt, which is the light blue boundary and has been built upon by 2016. Much of the remaining area of the original Green Belt has been fragmented and much of it now stands as a barrier between the older city and its newer suburbs rendering the city less compact than before and increasing the average travel distance within the city unnecessarily. But this is not the end of the story. President Xi Jinping has now stepped into the fray. In an important address to the Communist Party in 2017, he emphatically declared, we will complete works on drawing red lines for protecting the ecosystem, designing permanent, uh, designating permanent basic cropland and delineating boundaries for urban development. Whether these boundaries would be respected remains to be seen. We note that in Sao Paulo, that Sao Paulo is surrounded by a large greenbelt biosphere reserve. The emphasis here is on managing the ecosystem as a whole and indeed on creating red lines in this map, light green ones around protected areas rather than on cont containing urban expansion. Let us now come back to the important question of jurisdiction. In China, as we saw, containment has been mandated of justification, sorry, not jurisdiction. In China, as we saw earlier, the containment has been mandated to conserve the limited amount of cultivated land in the country in the name of food security, an important national security issue for China. The original justification for the English green belts, and I quote, controlling further urban growth, avoiding the merger, the merge of city into each other and separating the typical characters of town and countryside. Much of that justification did not stand the passage of time. The green belts could not hold urban population growth. Room to accommodate it simply, simply leapfrogged across the green belts and much more room was needed there than that provided by a few bucolic new towns. Green belts were also found to be not the ideal solution for granting urban residents access to open space as much of the area consisted of inaccessible agricultural lands. In fact, a hierarchy of public open spaces such as those of Toronto, Canada provided much better access to open space for their citizenry. Nantes, France, the leading example of the provision of access to open space is more than 40% of its area in public open spaces. Access to the open countryside, by the way, is better provided by green wedges rather than by green belts, like those of the 1947 plan for Copenhagen, for example. The justification for containment in the United States, which has successfully limited outward expansion in many cities, largely through regulatory barriers to development, not through strict peripheral containment, was largely motivated by this state for this taste for sprawl. The visceral distaste for large expanses of low density single family homes dependent on the despised car among planners and urban intellectuals to be sure, but not necessarily among the population at large, it was at its root aesthetic. Spoiled expanses and their commercial strip malls do not look or feel like a city. A real city is more compact. Atlanta doesn't feel like Barcelona, where you can walk everywhere. How Houston doesn't feel like Amsterdam, where you can buy, where you can bike everywhere. This visceral distaste for distaste for sprawling suburbs has acquired a new and considerably more serious urgency initially by the public interest to save on energy and later by the more pressing public interest to curb greenhouse gas emissions. It has been observed that urban transport is responsible for a respectable share of greenhouse gas emissions and that other things being equal, denser cities generate less greenhouse gas emissions from transport than less dense ones. Why? Because car trips are shorter, more people use public transport, more people can bike or walk from one place to the other. This of course may change when we shift to electric cars or if suburban homes were equipped with solar panels, but that is another matter. 
In cities in less developed countries, containment was often advanced in the name of savings on infrastructure, a real concern for cash starved municipalities. The more compact the city is, the shorter its road, its pipelines and its cable. Whether it is a virgin to sprawl, the preservation of the countryside, the protection of cultivated lands, energy savings, reduced greenhouse gas emissions from transport or shorter infrastructure line, containment still rules. A very recent World Bank report titled From Pancakes to Pyramids preaches containment in compact cities in less developed countries, calling for massive densification coupled with massive investment in public transport. It also calls for a massive increase in construction and mortgage finance that will provide multi for multi-story housing alternative that can replace the self-built low-rise informal settlements that now constitute some 70% of new housing in Sub-Saharan Africa. I worry that this is yet another well-intentioned pipe dream, uh, one that is not likely to materialize in the near future when cities in several developing nations, most notably in South Sub-Saharan Africa and the Indian subcontinent are still growing in leaps and bounds. To conclude, I have looked at the containment of urban expansion as it is preached and practiced, and I have found it wanting, especially when it is attempted in rapidly growing cities in less developed countries where more than 90% of the urbanization is now taking place. Many city governments in these countries are simply too weak to practice effective containment in the face of overwhelming demand for land on the urban fringe of cities by both formal and informal development. Containment is most likely to fail. With strict containment has been successful, and we will hear more about it from our panelists, we see two problematic outcomes. First, once the contained area is largely filled, we typically witness a rapid increase in land prices and a subsequent affordability crisis. Containment is now seen by more and more people as excluding them from the cities that they would like to live and work in but cannot afford to because of housing supply bottlenecks that result in exorbitant house price inflation. Second, as we mentioned before, when we discussed the case of Beijing, new development leapfrogs across green belts, making cities less compact, less energy efficient, and generating more rather than less greenhouse gas emissions. Finally, and this is particularly a troubling concern for me, City mayors and urban planners committed to containment are more than likely to underestimate the amount of land needed for urban expansion, hoping against hope that their cities will not expand. City mayors and urban planners committed to containment are thus less likely to plan for orderly and climate sensitive urban expansion on the fringe of their cities. After all, how can you plan for something that in your heart you really don't? want to happen. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Sally. Um, our next uh, speaker is Anel Horn, who uh, will tell us a little bit about South Africa, I hope. You know. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, Professor Angel and, and the, the other members of the panel. And thanks very much for the opportunity to speak a little bit about urban growth management in South Africa and our experiences and methods with it for the last, say, 20, 30 years. Um, I think what I'm going to do is the way in which I'm going to approach this presentation is just to give you a brief account of the historical evolution of urban growth management in South Africa. And then also just focus a little bit on the past and present experience that we've had with growth management in some of South Africa's largest cities. 
And then I'll speak to um, very briefly about an urban sprawl index that um, I've done some research on. And then I'll, I'll, I'll end off with highlighting some of the current challenges that we experience with regards to that. So um, many of you um, who are in attending this session may be aware of South Africa's political history, but historically um, the urban growth management that was undertaken in South Africa prior to 1994 and the democratic dispensation was basically an attempt by government to control the mass movement of people to cities. So this really represented a deliberate attempt by the apartheid government to restrict urbanization of specifically African people to the largest cities. So um, the majority of African people were um, during this time then deliberately positioned in homelands or um, as they were called self-governing territories, which were predominantly situated on the periphery of urban areas areas. And the main piece of legislation that we had in South Africa at the time was the National Group Areas Act, which prohibited the movement of African people to and from urban areas. And those people or those African people or colored people who, who did live in cities were located at the, further per, the furthest peripheries um, of cities and sort of separated by a buffer zone, usually an industrial area or a, a green belt or something like that. So the image on the right hand side, you can see um, represented the model of a typical apartheid city where you have your um, essentially white inner city area and then your white suburban area surrounding that. And then towards the periphery of the city, you would then find um, planned African settlements, planned settlements for Indian people and so forth. And then then um, a clear deliberate attempt to place a buffer between um, areas of, of uh, different races and, and white areas. So then um, after 1994 and the democratic dispensation, um, there was really a recognition of two definite desperate needs in the cities. The first was to provide former marginalized population groups such as African people with adequate shelter in the form of housing. And secondly, to start bringing people of different races closer to urban opportunities. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, the first need that of providing housing in terms of numbers of housing gained the most attention and government funding. And this resulted in initial post-apartheid planning policies prioritizing providing numbers of housing um, to people, irrespective of whether these housing units were located in good or, you know, good locations, locations close to other urban opportunities. So um, this element, this planned subsidized housing initiative by government, together with of course, the continued development of private sector initiatives and private security development estates at the urban periphery um, really resulted in a massive urban expansion at the time. So, um, and this obviously later on continued to grow this peripheral situation as a result of people from rural areas also continuing to migrate to cities. So essentially at the urban periphery, you then had subsidized housing initiatives, gated estates for the higher income bracket um, of people, and then also informal settlements as people migrated to the cities. So the initial attempts at growth management that was then really recognized as a priority um, was adapted from what was in vogue in European planning schools and European um, cities at that time. Um, and the University of Cape Town and the Planning Academia in South Africa really embraced the idea of putting in place urban growth management, but with the aim of creating more compact integrated cities. So via compaction, um, thereby increasing the integration of cities and increasing densification within the city boundaries and therefore also bringing more people closer to urban opportunities. And this really formed the foundation of the initial post-apartheid spa spatial planning response to the challenges that were presented um, to cities at that time. So in the city of Joburg, um, you can look at the two figures at the right. The first one represents the, the growth of the urban areas or suburban areas in the city of Johannesburg since the 1950s up to 2012. Unfortunately, it's, it's quite outdated now, but, but you can see where the majority of growth took place. And on the right hand side, you can see um, what the current urban boundary in the city of Joburg looks like at the moment. 
So the growth boundary in the city of Johannesburg was um, put in place in 2002 as a way to curb the uncontrolled urban expansion onto greenfield areas. And it later the growth boundary formed an integral part of the city's holistic approach to growth management as a means of um, enabling the city government to plan for the rollout of capital infrastructure investment by the local municipality. So um, this kind of boundary and the growth management uh, strategy was implemented with great vigor by planning officials at the city of Joburg, but they experienced several obstacles with this approach, specifically relating to pressure for development um, at municipal boundaries. So we, um, for example, the city of Joburg bordered with the city of Tswane and, and other local municipalities. Those areas became pressure points for development that then had to be negotiated with bordering municipalities. So that was quite a problem. And then obviously um, financial realities in South Africa means that there is always political pressure for any kind of private sector investment or development. And so, you know, that sort of creates a situation where you have official policy, but politicians continue to approve um, things that goes against that policy. So the urban growth boundary in the city of Joburg is still in place, but um, it has been reviewed and adapted. And as far as I understand, it's, um, it's also now used as a sort of services boundary rollout mechanism um, to plan for capital investment. And then um, moving on to Itikwini metropolitan area, which many of you may know as the city of Durban. They've also had an urban development line in place since 2002. And the rationale for this line was to, um, to create more cost-effective service delivery in the city of Itikwini, and also to achieve more densification of the existing footprint. And then obviously also the protection of the environmental resources in that very, um, very rich environmental natural area. But eventually through the course of a few years, the line became only a sort of indication of where the municipality would not support um, further infrastructure development. So uh, are you probably all aware of the situation that uh, the local authority will not provide any more services, but if you can pay for it yourself, you're welcome to go there. That's sort of a negotiation bargain with, with private developers. So currently the city of Itikwini do still use a development phasing line, which is not um, an official line, it's not reflected in any of the spatial policies, but it's an almost unofficial consideration of um, different applications. So looking at different, different development applications based on their merit and whether or not the local authority will support development or not. So it's kind of an ambiguous situation. And then as a result of two new large capital investments in the city of Itikwini, that of the Dubi Trade Board and the Kinshaka Airport, as you can see on the map on the um, bottom right, this really created a watering down effect of any form of urban growth management, because obviously those two uh, developments really stimulated private sector development in that area. And I'm told that especially low income housing project sees a lot of political support outside the urban development line. So that situation still persists of um, providing state housing outside of the urban development line and outside of what's actually considered to be good locations. And then just in terms of the city of Cape Town, the urban edge line was in place in, since 2001 in Cape Town. And it was also in an attempt to promote the concept of achieving more compaction within the city, and um, also to create a more efficient urban form that centers around the principles of public transportation and so forth. Um, but since 2012, many large scale amendments has taken place to, um, to this line in Cape Town. And this is just a little bit more detail on, on Cape Town specifically, where the red um, on the left hand side represents where um, development or the predominant development has taken place between 2014 and or since 2014. And on the right hand side where the red line represents the initial urban edge line that was put in place in 2001. And the blue represents um, some of the major amendments or concessions that has taken place to the line. And if you calculate all of those portions of land in hectares that's, um, that's been included in the urban edge, it, 
it constitutes quite a lot of, of new um, undeveloped land that's been included in the city. And most importantly in Cape Town has been the losses of um, very active and productive horticultural land in the city that's been conceded. And then also areas that has absolutely no services and no proper or efficient linkages to the city um, core that has been um, included in the urban edge. And, and all of these concessions has been made as a result of immense uh, political pressure. So as a result of the concessions that's been made, the urban edge policy in the city of Cape Town was eventually terminated in 2016. Um, but as I've heard, it was reintroduced in 2019. And as far as I understand, it also is now based on the idea of um, the local authority using it as a tool to plan for a future rollout of service delivery. Okay, so just briefly, the urban air, uh, well, urban sprawl index was research that I've undertaken with a colleague of mine in Cape Town, but also in other municipalities in the Western Cape. And the rationale was basically to calculate an index based on um, the, um, the rate of urban expansion versus the rate of population growth. And um, so the idea is that if you achieve an urban sprawl index that's larger than one, it would mean um, to what extent you have, you know, sort of achieved sprawl. Um, and as you can see on the left hand side there or on the right hand side that um, none of the cities actually experienced any rates of, of sprawl. So um, we're still not sure what that amounts to or what the reasons for that is, but um, that is research that we can engage on at another time when I'm not running severely out of time. Um, and then just finally to end off in terms of the challenges that we've experienced now, some of it I've alluded to be before, but I think um, from my side, in conclusion, that growth management in South Africa has two broad sets of challenges, the one being severe physical challenges that that that's mainly um, still an inheritance from the legacy of apartheid cities, which relates to um, the persistence of locating state assisted housing at the periphery and also in the view of our current, our current political dispensation favoring mega housing projects. So very large scale, um, lots of state assisted um, housing projects in, in one location. And then secondly, the increasing informality that we see in cities as people flock to, um, to urban areas and also um, the increase trend of sort of planned land invasion so really orchestrated carefully thought out land invasion that also tends to take place at the periphery of cities which then tends to be formalized um, after a few years and then um, obviously as as professor angel also mentioned the increase in land values when applying um, growth management instruments is something that um, you know a, a local authority with so many people who are really located in the poorest of the poor brackets really can't afford any artificial increase in land values. And then another physical challenge is polycentricity or at least the developer perception of polycentricity and speculation around polycentricity with the rise of new nodes. Um, and then everybody has an argument for, for locating near a, a new node that's, that's so-called establishing, but it's not always real, but it does happen. And changing ideas about centrality, what is really considered to be central, especially now after COVID, what will people actually consider to be a good location? And then of course, in South Africa, as in many other cities in the South, um, car dependence and um, our culture of needing space of people using their backyards for farming and um, livestock and having multiple families living in one space that those are cultural things that we need to to plan around but then a, a second broad category of issues in, in South Africa is institutional or political issues relating specifically to the policy making process and I've highlighted the final phase of the policy making process which is really the decision making process and where um, you know the policy needs to be implemented and through my research I found that um, many times in implementing a policy such as urban growth management this is really where the policy starts falling through the cracks so um, having a political uh, spearheads that are, are planting a certain goal but uh, local authority officials on the other hand saying different things that becomes really problematic but that is it from my side. Thank you very much.
mute myself and uh, thank you very much, Anel. Excellent presentation. Our next presenter is uh, Myung Jin Jun of uh, Korea, and he will talk about uh, Seoul, I think. Go ahead, Jun. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me share my uh, PPT. Hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, having me in this webinar. Uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, Seoul's Green Belt, uh, focusing on the accomplishment and consequences. And today's uh, talk consists of a three parts. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, I want to introduce the Seoul's Green Belt uh, with the history and uh, original goals. And also, uh, I will present the urban development uh, pattern inside and outside the green bed. And the second topic is uh, the, the effect of the green bed housing market and uh, urban structure. And uh, finally, uh, I will conclude with the policy uh, implication. So this map shows the uh, Seoul metropolitan area and it's a green bed. So the Seoul metropolitan area is the capital region of South Korea, and it has uh, three uh, governing uh, bodies, uh, city of Seoul, and the city of Incheon, and the Gyeonggi province. And its uh, population uh, has become three times larger uh, during the past uh, uh, half century, from uh, about uh, 9 million in 1970 to 26 million in 2020. So the, the blue color is a green belt, and uh, uh, the red color is uh, urbanized area. So this is central city. It's a contain uh, uh, 10 million people uh, with about 600 square kilometers. And of all the, uh, the uh, land size is about uh, more than 12,000 square kilometers. And the source green belt was introduced in 1971. Uh, it, it has been uh, rigidly maintained with only a few minor uh, amendments uh, between 2011. The current green belt area in the metropolitan region is uh, about 1,400 square kilometers which is 91% uh, of the total green belt area originally designated in 1971. So that means uh, only 9% of the uh, total green belt uh, area has been released uh, over the last uh, uh, half uh, centuries. Uh, like other, I mean, uh, green belt in other, in other cities in the world, the, uh, the the old green belt also has uh, uh, several objectives. The, the first and the primary objective was to contain urban development within the central city and uh, to prevent um, better the, uh, urban expansion. Secondly, uh, it is intended to protect environment and natural resources as well as uh, agricultural land. Uh, this is a sample image uh, from Google Earth uh, showing uh, urbanized area and green belt in Seoul. You can see a uh, built up area, and uh, this is green belt. Uh, this graph shows the population growth uh, uh, between 1970 to 20, 2020. And the, the blue color is the central city, the city of Seoul, and the red color is the suburban area. You can see here is the, the souls, I mean, the population peaked at 1990 and uh, it's almost stagnant. On the other hand, the urban area, the rapid, I mean, the uh, population growth, indicating a uh, substantial uh, population urbanization. And this is uh, employment growth uh, between 1998 and 2019. Uh, in, in the central cities, uh, the job uh, is steadily growing, as well as uh, suburban area, the same pattern. 
And this map showed the uh, new development between 2000 and uh, 2018, uh, extracted from the uh, satellite image. You can see here is the uh, lots of uh, uh, leaf flow type urban uh, uh, development outside the uh, green belt. In particular, uh, this is a 10 kilometer uh, band from the CBD. This is CBD and 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. So it's uh, uh, 20, between 20 to 30 kilometers, uh, uh, substantial uh, uh, new town development uh, took place. And also the uh, uh, Western part of the Seoul is a uh, uh, significant new development. Okay, let's move to the next topic, the, the effect of the green belt on the housing market and urban structure. Let's suppose the green belt had never, never existed. How would the special structure of the metropolitan region and housing market have been different? So I conducted a theoretical simulation using the monocentric city model, so-called the uh, Alonso-Mus-Nils model. And uh, this is a kind of a conceptual diagram uh, with and without green belt. So uh, if there is no green belt, the density or rent gradient uh, looks like this. But if there is a green belt imposed uh, between X1 and X2, uh, the green belt will push up the density and the rent uh, in the inner city uh, as well as the outer city. Also, uh, Green Belt will uh, push the city boundary uh, further away from the CBD. So this uh, uh, dot line is uh, the city boundary without Green Belt, and uh, this one is a city boundary with Green Belt. So this is a uh, uh, equations uh, for the model, but I'm, I'm going to skip uh, these uh, equations ex except to this one. So actually, I uh, tested uh, this, I mean, uh, integration in the models. Uh, the, there is no uh, development between uh, 11 kilometer and 25 kilometers away from the CBD. So uh, in order to contain the total population, uh, uh, will uh, change all other variables. So uh, this is notation. And uh, in order to apply this model to the soul, uh, I need to uh, parameterize those values. And uh, these values are coming from the uh, most recent uh, reliable sources. Now to uh, mimic the, uh, the current situation. Okay, uh, this the graph showed uh, uh, so uh, urban uh, boundaries with and without green belt. So the, uh, this is a uh, land rent uh, curve with green belt and without green belt. And this one is a uh, agricultural uh, land rent. So uh, if there is no green belt, the city boundary would be uh, 41.3 kilometers. And uh, with the green belt scenario, it become 44 kilometers. That means the green belt push the uh, city boundary uh, about by three kilometers. And since the uh, green belt is land use regulation, it will uh, decrease the uh, consumer's utility. So uh, the green belt will uh, decrease the uh, consumer's utility, utility from uh, 1425 to uh, 1358. And this is a uh, housing uh, price according to distance from the CBD. And uh, this is a green belt area band. And uh, the green belt pushed the housing price uh, up uh, in the inner city as well as our city. Uh, these two graphs also show the uh, housing size and uh, FAR. So if there is no green belt, the uh, source resident would uh, live in a, a larger uh, housing. And uh, the FAR also uh, increased 
in the inner city because of the beam depth. Actually, I estimate the vertical cost of the green deck uh, uh, from this model. And uh, since I, uh, we, we assume that uh, the commuting cost is uh, 650 US dollar per year, and the urban expansion effect is 2.7 kilometers, the compensating variation is uh, about 1,800 US dollar, which is representing 2.7% of uh, household income. And the agri consumer welfare cost of the green bag for uh, 10 million households, uh, equivalent to the uh, almost I mean, uh, 18 billion US dollar per year. Also, I conducted uh, several empirical analyses with the actual data, uh, which uh, support the, the result of the model simulation. So this is a population density for 2019. And the, the, uh, the red color is 2019 and the blue color is 20 population density according to distance from the CVD, uh, 100, 100 meter unit. So uh, if you, if you look, look at this uh, graph, it's uh, the population density increase in a suburban area. Uh, on the other hand, the, the population density decreased in the central city. So it's a uh, 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 population suburbanization. Uh, on the other hand, the improvement in density has different pattern compared with the population density. So you can see here is the uh, employment density increased in uh, inner city uh, rather than uh, uh, suburban area. I think because I mean the business are very reluctant to jump over the green bag because if they uh, jump over the green bag, they will lose uh, I mean the agglomeration economy uh, if, if that uh, enjoy uh, that they enjoy in the central city. And this is a housing price for 2006 and 2021 and this year. So uh, uh, the housing price in uh, Current housing price, the so very high in uh, central city. So uh, uh, this area is the uh, Gangnam area, which is a uh, Beverly Hills in, in, in Seoul. So uh, and uh, this uh, graph show the uh, average uh, commuting time uh, among uh, OECD countries. Uh, look at this. I mean, the Korea is uh, uh, at, at, at length at top at, at first. It's uh, almost uh, 60 minutes uh, per day commuting time. So that means, I mean, the Korean commuters uh, the, spend the long, longest time in the commuting time, which will uh, uh, provide, I mean, the a significant uh, uh, utility. So uh, this, uh, this, these are my uh, policy implications. The green bears seem to make a successful contribution to preserve, preserving natural and environmental resource, uh, but to fail to prevent urban expansion. And the green belt uh, result in a core city densification in particular employment leapfrog development, worsening jobs housing balance, and longer commuting time. So uh, I don't want to establish them in the case against the green bag. So on the contrary, I believe that the, the problem was not the green bag itself, but the rather rigid boundaries established 50 years ago. So it is not like London and the negative consequence of the GB uh, uh, should not be ignored. So about 40% of land within the green belt uh, is a farmland, uh, open land, not forest. So if some of the uh, this land is converted to urban uses, uh, it could bring uh, social benefits such as uh, stabilizing housing and land price, improving uh, job housing mismatches, and uh, uh, reduction of commuting cost without compromising the function of the green belt. So this is uh, all I want to talk.
Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I, I love it because it confirms some ideas that I had only informally and, uh, and, and uh, he's done this uh, much more formally uh, uh, using, a, using an, the Urban model. Uh, our uh, third speaker, I think our last in line here is Alan Mace, and he's going to talk about the London Green Belt. Thank you. Go ahead, Alan. Alan, so thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, participate. Um, I'm going to run through um, twelve slides on the London Green Belt to um, vaguely work to my twelve minutes. Um, I think in some ways the story to me sounds quite um, familiar to or, or similar to um, the the case of Seoul, uh, in that I'm going to be talking about some of the effects of a very rigid uh, boundary. But with no further ado, uh, let me run through my slide. So first of all, um, around 8% of England is developed that is, has some sort of building on it. Um, and 40% of land is protected against by a protect, protected against development by one or more environmental designations. Uh, important to say that there are many other environmental designations in uh, England apart from just the Greenbelt. And sometimes they overlap. So sometimes land can have a dual designation. Of this 12% of England's land, um, figures vary, it's actually 12.4% is Greenbelt. Uh, these are figures from the Ministry of Housing, um, Community and Local Government. And you can see the Greenbelts on the map to the right uh, around the various um, cities and urban conurbations. Again, I'm talking about England, not, not England, Scotland and Wales, just England. So the, the green belt around London, the metropolitan green belt, which is what I'm going to talk about today, um, constitutes 516,000 hectares. It's three times bigger than London itself, uh, which is 157,000 hectares. And Google tells me that the five New York um, boroughs are 78,308 hectares, just for comparison. So to give a sense that the metropolitan green belt is very large. It's not designated by London. Most of it was designated in the 1950s and it's designated by each of the individual districts um, who uh, control the land within which the green belt sits. So there are multiple districts who have individually designated green belt that all stitches together, joins together to form the metropolitan green belt. 7% uh, of this metropolitan green belt is actually inside London. So if we look at the red boundary going around London, we can see some of it, the green belt is inside. And that 7% of the total, so the 7% inside London, constitutes 22% of London's land. So 22% of land inside London is not available for, um, for development because of green belt policy. Very quickly, there are five reasons the government sent, and we have a very centralized government system in the UK. Um, so the, the central government has five reasons. And the first four kind of look fairly similar, but it's about checking unrestricted sprawl, preventing neighborhood towns merging, assisting, uh, safeguarding the countryside from encroachment, preserving settings of historic towns. A fifth one was added later, and this is particularly important in the context of London, which is to um, assist in urban regeneration by encouraging the recycling of derelict uh, and other urban land. It might seem odd, as I say, that um, given that the four of the reasons for having Greenbelt is to prevent uh, the sprawl or the linking of different cities into one another, it might seem odd that London has Greenbelt actually inside its own borders. I'll come back to that. So Greenbelt is importantly, it's a policy designation. It's not about ownership. So when the state designates land as Greenbelt, it doesn't own that land. So it can't change the use of the land. Effectively, the policy freezes the current use and then hands over the power to the state through planning to agree restricted changes within Greenbelt. And as you can see in the policy, there's Greenbelt, which is green with horses on it. 
There is green belt, which is not very green with motorways and electricity pylons on it. And at the bottom, we bury people in the green belt. So we have cemeteries in the green belt. Um, it's not necessarily open land. As well as setting out the purposes of the green belt, central government through uh, what's called the national planning policy framework has also stated that the extent of the green belt is more or less fixed. In other words, central government doesn't support lots more green belt or lots um, of green belt removal. So that's the general position, that's the, the working assumption. And so we have a very uh, strictly enforced policy, very heavily underwritten by central government. The role of local government is it can review green belt boundaries when it's writing new policy, uh, and it can permit development in the ground in the green belt if there are exceptional circumstances for this to happen. Uh, and often these are open to challenge in the court and often won't receive support from central government. So in effect, we have a very heavily underwritten policy uh, which sees not much loss of green belt. I'll come to that. Uh, in the next slide. So it's a successful policy because it's durable. It's been around since the 90s, well, it's been around since the 1930s, but currently in its current extent, it's been around since the mid 1950s. People understand that it's not a policy that's up for grabs. It's not up for negotiation. Uh, and as a colleague Ian Gordon has said, it's a policy that's easy to enforce because it's a policy where you just have to say no. You don't have to put any resource into it. You just refuse permission to build on the green belt. Small proportions are lost, and that's been more in recent years. So if we look at data from recent government figures, uh, we can see that 2010, 2011, this is across the whole country, not just the metropolitan green belt, uh, very small amounts lost, but bigger figures in 2017, 18, and in 2018, 19. However, this said, even in 2017-18, losing 5,070 hectares of Greenbelt is 0.3% of the total. So it gives a sense that we're, we're, we're losing some Greenbelt across the country, but um, you know, not vast amounts as a proportion. And also important to say that the Greenbelt uh, does enjoy great public support. It's often invoked. It's probably the only planning policy that nearly everyone in the country knows and understands. And there is indeed a, a whole lobby group with a membership of around 40,000 called the Campaign to Protect Rural England. And their whole purpose, their raison d'etre, is to protect the Greenbelt and to lobby for its retention. The Greenbelt, as we've heard in other cases, um, has led to successful urban containment, but it has led to regional expansion. Uh, Kate Barker, uh, a Treasury uh, economist from the Treasury, uh, noted this most recently in 2004. And indeed, the campaign for the protection to prevent, uh, to protect rural England, sorry, the campaign for, to protect rural England, um, accepts that one of the effects of Greenbelt um, is longer commutes over the Greenbelt and for them, it's a price worth paying. Perhaps more contentiously, as one of several policies that contain land supply, it leads to higher land prices and higher, therefore higher house prices. And one of the things I want to dwell on, perhaps a little bit differently from the previous um, presentation, is that how this affects developer behavior, which is affected by the constraints on land supply. So although the exact contribution of Greenbelt is not easily isolated in terms of its effect on land prices and house prices, because we have lots of other designations, uh, nevertheless, um, we can, we can assume that Greenbelt contributes to this. Uh, and I'm turning in my final few slides to the case of London and to the case of an affordability problem in London, which I would note is not you know, clearly not unique to London. Moving on, I'm very aware of my time. Uh, so London was a shrinking city between 1930 and 1980, mid-1980s. I think this is important. So for much of the life of the Green Belt, London was shrinking. Partly it was shrinking because of policy. So there was a policy to develop new towns outside of London, to move population from London to the new towns, 
and to provide large quantities of public housing. This is a sort of post Second World War policy. And in many ways, I, the Greenbelt was part of this policy and is really now an orphaned policy because we no longer build new towns. We no longer build much public housing, but we still enforce the Greenbelt. So we have a sort of the supply policy of new towns and the supply policy of public housing has gone, but the constraint policy of, of Greenbelt has remained. And then we also have this historical quirk in the case of London, um, that because the green belt was designated before London was actually um, shaped in its, so the contemporary London was formalized in 1964, because the green belt came first, we have green belt inside London. So oddly, we're sort of stopping bits of London joining up to other bits of London through the bits of green belt, the 22% of London that is green belt. Even if we weren't just seeking to constrain the growth of London, that fifth more recent reason for Greenbelt about assisting urban regeneration still holds and is often used as the reason for maintaining London's Greenbelt. So in my last few slides, I suppose the key question for me is, is Brownfield enough? Uh, the, the image to the right is just a map of um, actually the UK, including Scotland and Wales, showing but distributed by population. So you can see where most of the population lives and most of it in England lives in London or around London. Uh, so you know, it's a significant um, significant part of the country in terms of population. Is Brownfield enough? Nearly all, uh, the, again, the image on the right just very briefly shows you the house price to earnings ratio in the UK. The red line is London. Uh, the blue line is the UK average. And what you can see is since the, uh, since, since the 2008 um, financial crisis in housing international crisis, you can see that London has sort of separated off from the rest of the UK and become far less affordable. So a, a sort of 10 to 11 uh, ratio of income to a house price to income. Nearly any development in London, just about all of it, will happen on brownfield land. Uh, we're not gonna build on the garden of Buckingham Palace or on high park. So nearly all permissions happen on brownfield land. So the crucial question is, you know, if we're going to maintain the green belt, do we have enough land in London? The requirements and permissions don't look like a bad fit. So if we look in the orange block, uh, current land and plan policy is for just over 50,000 houses um, a year to be built in London. Uh, the, the, the need is actually for more, over 60 if you look at the second orange bar, um, but the, the, uh, it was recognised we wouldn't manage to build that, so the current target is 52,000 um, homes um, over the planned period, 10-year period. Um, and if we look at the um, permissions, we can see that that looks pretty good. So 2016, we're permitting uh, around 50,000 permissions, 2017, over um, 60,000 permissions. The problem comes when we look, uh, and remember nearly all of these are on brownfield land, the problem comes when we look at what gets built. And there's a big gap here. So we are actually building around 25,000 uh, properties a year in London. And here we come to developer behavior. So this constraint in land supply affects what, um, what uh, builders do. And uh, one of the key things is, is uh, well, I'll go through this very quickly. Um, builders tend to, because they know it's hard to acquire more land, they tend to build more uh, on less land. So they do increase their density substantially in London. Uh, but they don't tend to build more in general. They're just building roughly the same amount of housing that they always build, but on less land. So we're not solving our housing shortage. What we are is densifying the land we do build on. Uh, and another uh, element of this is that most of the greenfield land that's going to provide housing are, is on big sites, ex-industrial and other sorts of sites. And it's generally big developers who are going to develop these big sites and again, the developers tend to control the rate of the build out, again, because they're aware of the difficulty of acquiring more housing and big developers have a model for the amount of housing they want to deliver. Um, and they're not very interested in hugely ratcheting up their delivery. So because of time, just jumping to the bottom there, um, uh, Quad though and Bernie Stringer have talked about this. 
And when we look at big um, brownfield development sites in London, Battersea Power Station, King's Cross, Woolwich, these are 20 to 30 year projects um, to get them through planning, deliver major new infrastructure like new railway lines uh, and to have them built out. And similarly, densifying the suburbs is very tricky. So our argument uh, is a national review of Greenbelt uh, needed? Well, one argument of ours is yes, because it's happening in bit, bit by bit, not massively, but it's still happening and it will be better to plan it spatially in a more organized way than just allowing for odd exemptions here and there, which are not planned in any sort of strategic manner. Um, because we think that signaling the intent to revise a proportion of Greenbelt could change developer behavior and also reduce landowner expectations of the price they can expect to receive for land. Uh, and we'll give an example here, Taplow, where the arrow is pointing to. It's a new railway station as part of Crossrail, uh, uh, the Crossrail line going across uh, East West London. It's in the green belt. So we've built a new railway station there. We have brand new infrastructure. We can't build any more housing there because it's in the green belt. So this is an example where we think there's a case for some managed review of green belt. This is a model we've done. If Crossrail 2 were to be built, which is a north-south line, Crossrail 1 has been built, Crossrail 2 is still on the books. Um, then we've identified um, sort of ped sheds around um, the, the proposed stations, which could provide new land for building in the green belt, but where new stations would make it sensible to build. So our argument is for some revision of the green belt, uh, with planned redesignations, uh, offering reassurance um, that this isn't the thin end of the wedge. We're not about to concrete over the whole of the green belt, that we're identifying areas that overall there will be a very small percentage of land built on, that we should be building affordable, environmentally efficient housing where we do build on the green belt near to public transport. Uh, and where the vast majority of Greenbelt would remain. So if we look at the, the sort of model of building around uh, public infrastructure, public transport, we're looking at no more than three, four, five percent at the most of Greenbelt that we're seeking to offer up for development. Uh, it's a long-standing story. Peter Hall, I recommend his work to you, The Containment of Urban England from 1973. Peter recognised in 1973 some of the unintended consequences of the green belt, uh, including the price pressures it places on households uh, for, for housing and the limits in internal space in the UK because housing is, is very expensive. Um, just to conclude on this slide, campaign to protect rural England continue to argue there's enough brownfield, that brownfield is enough. This is not, in my view, a tenable argument. If we look at developer behavior, if we look at the number of permissions that are built out, Everything suggests that we're not going to build enough housing under the current model, just reliant on Greenbelt. More tenable, in my view, would be if the campaign for protection of rural England simply said, yes, it inflates house costs. Yes, we won't meet our housing need, but that's a price worth paying. That, to me, is a, a tenable argument, whether you agree with it or not. Um, I think the other case would be to have more drastic inventions in the housing market, maybe a return to new towns policy, if we are gonna to continue to maintain the green belt in its current form. And finally, the last thing I wanted to say uh, in a very quick run through is that one of the dangers I think in looking at green belt is we get very fixated on supply and the need to supply more housing numbers. And I think there is a legitimate case for questioning also the demand side. Uh, in cities, world cities like London, where there is international demand coming in for housing, I think there is a question about demand management as well as supply management. So I do have concerns that, you know, although I am supportive of some de-designation of Greenbelt, I think we need to look at demand side questions as well if we're going to address um, the housing crisis we have in London. Very fast run through and I have run over time a bit, so excuse me. And I've just put on the presentation some, uh, some references as well. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, I, am, uh, I think I am up next for a few minutes to give an overview of a uh, sort of summary of, of what I have learned from this, these presentations. 
and I'm doing this in real time. I did not write these down in advance. So uh, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you can uh, bear with me if you like. I, I'm gonna start uh, telling a uh, brief anecdote. I was introduced to the Green Belt on my honeymoon uh, in 1973. My wife's, we, my, my wife and I, my bride and I went to England uh, for our honeymoon and to London in particular. She had a cousin, she hadn't uh, met very much before, uh, who was a, 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 a barrister or a solicitor in, in the city. And we visited his office and it was, it was truly a sight out of Charles Dickens, giant piles of uh, law books, one on top of the other. Am I on here? Yes. Uh, and uh, he then invited us to go out to his home to, for dinner, uh, you know, wonderful gesture. And uh, uh, so we got in his car, uh, a very nice car. I think it was a Rolls Royce. Uh, he was a very successful barrister. And we then drove and drove and drove almost an hour across the entire green belt out to his home in some suburb whose name I do not recall. The green belt did not contain uh, the uh, suburban expansion. It simply pushed it farther away. And what I am struck by of these, uh, of most of these, uh, actually all of the, the uh, 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 cities that uh, that Solly has uh, uh, assembled by way of uh, three uh, uh, excellent scholars who have, who have looked at their uh, uh, at their home cities is a striking amount of commonality among this attempt to limit urban expansion. The rationales vary, uh, although not that all that much, they vary uh, temporally rather than, uh, uh, than, than, than across cultures. Uh, I think the one rationale that wasn't mentioned is uh, one of the rationales for the Green Belt in London was, was the experience in World War II of getting bombed. Uh, a decentralizing population was a good thing. And even in America for a time, suburban sprawl was to be praised because it might re re increase resi resistance to an atomic attack by the Russians or somebody like that. Uh, all of, of the things have fortunately faded. Uh, so so uh, uh, we, we have uh, gone to other, polic other policy rationales. Uh, uh, for them. And the rationales are pretty similar, uh, in, environmental, uh, uh, preventing sprawl, uh, facilitating public transit, uh, uh, and, uh, agricultural uh, security. Uh, the agricultural security, I've written papers about this, strikes me as completely wrong. Uh, we are not running out of farmland. Uh, we have uh, productivity of farmers has increased. That's one reason they're coming to cities. They don't leave so many farmers out in the countryside because productivity of uh, farming. Uh, food prices generally have gone down. World hunger has decreased, not increased as urbanization has proceeded. So, so I think uh, we can dispose of that rationale. But I think my, my own view is that uh, disposing of rationales as a way of combating excesses of, of green belt uh, preservationism uh, is, is generally not a good idea. There's always another rationale you can, you can dig up. Uh, and, and here I think, as, as I mentioned, uh, talking about the demand side is something you need to, to do. Why, why do uh, residents who live uh, in the Green Belt, uh, why is there this, uh, I forget the name of the acronym here, the, this committee that wants to preserve the Green Belt? A, a lot of this has to do with what I call NIMBYism writ, writ large and what's going on with, in NIMBYism in, in America. And I suspect a lot of other places are entrenched homeowners who want to protect the value of their house. Uh, in the United States in particular, we over subsidize our housing with mortgage deductions and tax deductions and so forth. Uh, one, one of the uh, strangest things that the Trump administration actually did for urban planning was, get, was limit the state and local tax deduction which, uh, re which slightly reduced the subsidies to owner-occupied housing. Uh, now in the reconciliation bill in Congress under the Biden administration, uh, many congressmen from high-income states want to get rid of that, uh, uh, that wonderful subsidy to high-income people that makes them overly sensitive to their housing uh, values. Um, so, so there is lots of leapfrog uh, develop, uh, a response to green bills and um, uh, there's certainly variety among cities. And I think uh, 
uh, we're focusing on, 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 on large cities here, uh, Joburg in South Africa, uh, and, and Seoul in, in Korea, and, uh, and of course London um, in, 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 our, in our particulars. Uh, one of the things that we, we might look at, and I wonder if there is a variety within these societies within the country that, to see uh, uh, whether we can get a, a, a stronger handle on what the effects of these green belts are and what the and what the useful policies might be to uh, to deal with them and uh, 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 the comparison that I made in my my last book uh, might be my last book ever uh, uh, called zoning rules uh, was uh, to take two paradigmatic opposites one was Portland which has a successful green belt uh, it likes its green belt and uh, and it does uh, unusual among cities that have developed containment policies, attempts to force local governments to upzone, to increase density within, this, within the, uh, uh, the urban boundary uh, uh, and not just exclude people from the exurban boundary, which is the, the more common and successful policy. And, and the other paradigm, opposite paradigm, was Houston, Texas which is the city that every planner loves and hates at the same time, because it is, it is the true exception. It doesn't have zoning. It doesn't have an urban containment. Uh, its urban containment is to annex uh, 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 land or outside and, and bring it inside the city once it has gotten municipal services. And, and so I think these, these are useful comparisons. I don't think my own view of these things is that both of them uh, they're extremes for a reason, and, and the, they both have serious problems. Uh, I think Jung uh, 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 in, in analyzing this, uh, uh, struck them uh, quite well, uh, at least in terms that an urban economist would understand, which is, which is uh, the green belt works, but it's, it's sort of like squeezing a balloon, and the one side goes up and the other side goes up, both in population density and land values. And, 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 and when we look at, at the admittedly over, you know, admittedly highly simplified, I don't say oversimplified, uh, Alonzo Muth Mills model uh, of this, th this causes uh, serious uh, reductions in well, well being, uh, welfare, well being of the uh, uh, city's uh, residents and the society's whole. I would point out that, that manifestations of this are also uh, showing up in, uh, in, in, in national debates in the United States about are the exclusionary policies, which, of which green bills are at least a partial manifestation, are these creating enormous, creating the, uh, the gaps between the haves and the haves nots, the haves living in affluent suburbs or nice cities, uh, excluding the, uh, of course we know from South Africa that was an official policy uh, before the end of apartheid. Uh, but the real question is, that are, 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 the, are we engaging in a kind of soft apartheid uh, hidden in green belt language uh, in, 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 the, in, in other societies as well? Uh, the other two things I would want to uh, uh, talk about, and I think in some sense, because you're geographers and you're like me, you see over my shoulder here, uh, uh, maps of the U.S., I'm obviously a U.S.-oriented person. I like maps a lot. But we need to talk also about the structure of local government, the structure of government activity in, in, in conducting these things. In the United States, one of the problematic structures is we have a great deal of local control, which generally successfully gives the locals what they want, but the whole is uh, 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 the sum of the parts of all of these uh, uh, successful decentralizations with regard to zoning and, and, and land preservation. Uh, it ends up being a city that is not as uh, an urban area that is not as successful uh, as it ought to be. I think so. We, we need to step away from the maps a little bit, or at least draw some things in the maps uh, representing the localities and ask how these localities, uh, uh, the, particularly their homeowner interests, that uh, uh, this, this is one of the things that, that has struck me, incidentally, is the difference between England, which I know a little bit about, and the United States is. England has this highly centralized policy. The United States has a highly decentralized policy. We end up with the same darn problem. <laughs> uh, 
Why is that? Uh, maybe England isn't quite as centralized, if I hear the anecdotes at least, that they have to have planning review, uh, acceptance of the plan at the local level, uh, and maybe they need to uh, look at this by way of government instruction. I think I've taken up uh, enough of my time here, and I'd like, uh, I think at this point, to have the, uh, uh, the uh, panelists respond if they want to, uh, to any, any of my observations and then see if we can take some questions from uh, from from the audience uh, that we have out here in our meager time we have left here so uh, I'll, I'll go in order at, at an l she on yeah there you are. hi <laughs> thank you so much um thanks for for your wrapping up or you know your conclusion i thought it was very interesting and um and I agree with with much of what you said. I think um, it was interesting to see that even though the situation in London is completely different from what we experience in South Africa in terms of, um, you know, the demographics of the country and also in terms of economic growth and so forth, that we do indeed share similarities in terms of how um, how growth management is operated. What I what I'm envious about is the amount of buy in that people in London seems to have in terms of buying into the, the green belt and the amount of support that uh, that the, the general population is, is giving to that. And um, I'm hoping that eventually we'll be able to create that, that sort of commitment and, um, and buy-in from, from the general population in South Africa also, and in realizing that all of this is actually going to contribute to a better quality of life, yes. So. Thank you, Young Jun. Unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you for your uh, comments, and uh, I uh, totally agree with you. And I, I uh, will be surprised. I mean, the London's case and the source case uh, is uh, very similar. And uh, but I, I think it's a as a story, uh, uh, story's presentations and uh, Tokyo and. Uh, uh, Beijing, uh, they are almost abandoned. Uh, Tokyo is completely abandoned uh, green belt, I think, and uh, uh, Beijing uh, is uh, partially maintaining the green belt, right? So, but in, in Seoul, so we uh, 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 a different uh, situation. It's, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, it's, uh, we strictly uh, maintain the, uh, most of the green belt. For the uh, almost I mean, uh, half century. So, thanks, Alan. Yes, I think all I would just pick up on um, from your summing up there, which, which I strongly agree with, is the sort of the aspect of governance. And I do think that it's fascinating that across these comparisons, but also looking at the US, how very different models of governance. Um, you know, to an extent within the sort of notion of variegated capitalism, you know, very different economic models still produce some of the uh, what looks like some quite common uh, issues, which I, I think is a, sort of an interesting um, thought provoking uh, point to, to, to pick up on. Um, so, you know, how we end up with the same issues across different forms of, uh, of governance. And I think also the importance of seeking to deal with those, because um, although I am an advocate for some controlled Greenbelt reform in the context of the UK, not least because of the sheer scale of it, um, I'm, I'm certainly not um, advocating to lose you know, all of the Greenbelt. And so I suppose the question is, you know, how can we do densification better in a way that does lead to affordable uh, and quality accommodation? Uh, Alan, uh, uh, Sally? Yeah. Uh, I find all of this uh, quite fascinating. I think that uh, I, I just want to make a couple of comments in terms of the, the, uh, what I heard. And that is the success of the Portland uh, urban uh, growth boundary uh, is that uh, the population growth there has been uh, rather slow. And uh, nothing to compare with the population growth in Seoul or the population growth in uh, in South Africa. So when you have slow population growth, you can maintain uh, uh, a growth boundary as a, as a way of containing uh, urban expansion. 
By the way, in Seoul, in, in Portland, which is interesting, uh, the Portland Urban Growth Boundaries uh, uh, borders the Willamette River. On the other side of the Willamette River is Washington State. Washington State does not have a very strong urban growth boundary, so a lot of the pressure to develop is in the Washington, on the Vancouver, Washington side, so that it does have some kind of a valve to, uh, uh, to get rid of that uh, pressure. The, the thing that strikes me in the presentations, in Alan's particularly, is that the containment function has been abandoned, basically. The, the protection uh, of the green belt is just uh, people want to protect the green area. They would just like the idea of having uh, green space and they want to protect the green space, which has nothing to do with containment because containment is already gone as we've seen in the maps that you've shown and that uh, um, Jung Jin has shown is way beyond uh, the, the urban expansion is way beyond the green belt. So the green belt, does not function as containment anymore. So basically my conclusion from this discussion is that there is no effective containment. Uh, there's no effective containment. I mean, we can have green belts and we can have uh, green areas or green wedges or urban open space, but that, that uh, has very little to do with containment. Thank you. I think uh, I think we've run out of time. Uh, I guess I should mention for people who had questions or watching uh, online, uh, if you send if you if you write down your questions uh, and either send us individual email or send it to Solly and have them distributed, we can we can answer those questions and start a dialogue. Uh, uh, sometimes actually much more deep than we can go to into now. I've I've done this before and, it, and it's actually uh, uh, sometimes been quite productive. So uh, thanks, thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with us. Are we done now? Thank you. I, I as uh, uh, kind of the organizer of the urban expansion webinar series, I want to thank you. I want to thank Bill for moderating, and I want to say thank uh, Anel, Jungian, and uh, Alan Pace for their very instructive presentation. And for uh, uh, Richard and Angela keeping the support and for Juan for organizing it. Uh, I want to just announce the fourth uh, webinar on urban expansion, which will talk about the kind of experiences on the ground of people that try to do uh, orderly urban expansion in uh, Colombia, uh, Ethiopia, uh, will take place four weeks from now on Thursday. And we invite you all to join. Thank you very much for joining, and we see you during the next webinar. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.